So yeah, so I'm delighted to um, be here today and speaking alongside Teo and actually alongside everyone. I feel completely um, uh, in awe of everyone who's who's been just speaking so much wisdom and experience. So um, I hope I can do my best. So um, just a bit about Design Council first. We are the government's advisor on design and we work across architecture and the built environment, business innovation and social innovation. And we've been around since 1944. We were set up by Churchill's wartime government in order to raise design standards to rebuild the post-war economy. So, you know, very relevant today as we're building back uh, post-COVID. So the way that we work, we champion the value of design in four ways. We do research to show its value. We give strategic advice, advice to key clients uh, with people like uh, Teo in our expert network. Uh, we demonstrate through design-led programs and we influence policy to embed design, good design, I should say. One of our programs um, is called Design in the Public Sector, and we've been doing this with the LGA for about seven years. And seven years ago, it was really revolutionary in that it supported councils to use design, or some people call it, say, call it design thinking, to redesign their services from planning services to adult social care so that they were more human-centered, they were designed for people and not for process. Um, start with an understanding of the experience of the citizen, the resident, their motivations and behaviors, their aspirations and dreams, and design services from that point rather from, than from the organization. And as this design approach proved its worth and people could see that this was a much better way of working, it was asked to take on bigger challenges so like place-based health or this year, climate change, climate crisis, I should say. So an approach that starts with people is still very crucial, but we know it's more complex than just one service or one organization. There's more st stakeholders, including the planet, including nature, and they need to be involved in our decisions. So we started to evolve our design approach to cater for those more systemic challenges. And at the same time, we've been doing some research into design for net zero. Um, we interviewed about 20 designers from different design backgrounds, fashion, service, architecture, product design. And what we found is that net zero alone is not enough. And that's what Jane and Alex and others have been saying. Designers were thinking beyond that target because they weren't uh, just focusing just on the environmental issue. They were looking at social issues, cultural issues as well. And we also found that designers needed to work with each other and with different disciplines. And you can see some of the barriers that they faced here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, and there's some, of course, that we need to tackle with policy, but a fair few of them could be improved by building these considerations into the design process and creating a kind of shared language where different design disciplines can come together. Each design discipline has its absolute kind of technical expertise. Um, but that doesn't always mean that they can work together. So we, from all of this, we created a systemic design framework, which I'm going to share with you quickly. And then Teo is going to give a brilliant example of it. And Teo was one of our interviewees. So some of the things we found, we thought, found there were four characteristics of designers working in this way. The system thinker being able to look and see how everything connects. Um, important a leader and storyteller, someone who can make the case and be tenacious and, and paint that hopeful vision. A designer and maker, because actually sometimes you get lost in the complexity and you need to make something to take the step forward. And of course, a connector and convener who can make the connections between lots of different interventions. And actually, when you start a design process, Getting everyone to agree a set of values, as Jane was saying, at the beginning of that process and making sure that they're shared values, that is totally going to determine the out outcome. I mean, in a way, that is the meta design of the project. And so we offer these as kind of starters that teams, partnerships can come together. So being people and planet centered, not just thinking about individual users, but more collective, inclusive and welcoming difference and thinking about um, marginalized communities and centering them, zooming in and out from now to future generations, from the micro to the macro, from what you're doing in your personal life to your project, 
collaborating and connecting, um, being circular and regenerative. Jennifer um, was talking about the need to understand what we've got already, not always creating something new, and then testing and experimenting and growing new ideas. And we um, kind of put this together in a, into a bit of a process. Some of you might know that the Double Diamond, which is um, our kind of um, design process, which basically um, has two diamonds and it says before jumping to a solution, do some research first. Um, and we think that's really important here and you can see them, but actually it's the invisible um, activity that goes around the design process, the vision setting, the connections, the relationships, continuing the journey and leadership and storytelling that are really important. So I think the next two slides just kind of make that point. And then also kind of just visualizing some of the key concepts in our work. So zooming in and out through this lens, seeing the micro and the macro, but also disrupting and remaking, really getting down to the core of the issue and then making something that can kind of disrupt it and, and shift it. Um, and then finally to say that often when we design, we are concentrated on our kind of particular projects, but actually we need to make sure that we're connecting up with lots and lots of different interventions um, so that we can build a bigger movement. So that's our kind of high level uh, framework. There's more detail in the report which you can put into the, the chat, but to really bring some of this to life, I will pass over to Teo. I was going to say, what a delightful opportunity to, be, to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. So just to recap, my name is Dr. Olutayo Omoniton Adibuali, call me Tayo. I work as a sustainability strategist and I'm director of Circadia. And it's an honor also to work as a design council expert ambassador. And here, my role is a storyteller. And what I want you to do is almost close your eyes and just imagine this setting. Imagine you're in an urban city of Salford, which borders Greater Manchester. Just imagine if somehow out of magic, you could have a mixture of blue and green infrastructure and in there, you'd have lakes and ponds, and you would be able to see all sorts of different birds, of herrings, egrets, wildlife, daisies, common bees, butterflies. This is actual fact. And we got here because the Northwest Regional Flood and Coastal Committee worked with a large number of partners and went beyond a brief to design a flood alleviation structure, which as well as protecting 1900 houses down the line, created this gem of beauty so not only did it protect the houses of the people living in that community, but it gave them an asset, a green asset, a jewel. And don't just believe my words. After, I will put a link on which shows you, there's a video of this, and the video is beautiful because you actually hear the descriptions of people from those communities and the councillors and all the different stakeholders. When you look at the edits at the end of the little video, you'll see the different stakeholders that work together, that had a shared visit, vision, that went, went beyond the brief to create something special, something that not only protected those 1900 houses, but actually created an area of wildlife, somewhere that they could improve the health and well-being, a place of safety. And this is what we can achieve. So the goal is that when you're thinking about design, think about that design 
so that it can serve more than the one purpose. Think about going beyond the brief. Think about how you can share that vision with your stakeholders. Now, interestingly, when we look at the actual flood alleviation programme within, um, within England and Wales, this idea of creating wider benefits from a flood alleviation project is actually now the norm. So it's not that you just think about designing something that protects houses from flooding. It's a whole wide range of other issues that you're trying to address as well. And that includes things like net zero, carbon, water management, natural flood, sustainable urban drainage, etc. This is what can be achieved when we work together and you've got good design and you go above and beyond the brief. Thank you. Sorry, two things to add actually. I will add links both to this particular Salford wetlands, which is on the screen here, but do watch the video. I'll add a link to that. And also as part of the Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, we also have a, a separate website called the Flood Hub. And on there, you'll be able to see a number of other flood alleviation schemes where we have focused on creating those wider benefits as well as the key function, which is to reduce the um, buildings, businesses, communities from flooding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Teo. And um, that, that whole concept of going beyond the brief and looking at the, at, at the wider picture is so important. So um, I would want to just pop back and have a quick chat with Kat, if I may, going back into design in public services. In uh, much of the work with LSBU is doing with local authorities, the UK GBC, the LGA, et cetera, which I, I shared stakeholders. We see local authorities trying to accelerate um, domestic retrofits, but finding the retrofit ecosystem is very fragmented and really tricky for homeowners and private landlords to navigate. And the topic of service process design keeps coming up as a possible way forward. But I'm frequently asked, what exactly is it? And I know that you have um, your design in public service and you're quite passionate yourself about service process design. So could you explain how it might be the answer for something such as a broken ecosystem, as, as a you know, developed system as like re retrofit, which isn't designed, but has evolved? And, um, and other net zero challenges. How, how does service process design the public service come to bear in this, in this story? Yeah, I think service design is just so important. And um, uh, I can give you another a little example. So um, service design for people who don't know is the design of services. Um, and usually what happens is you start with people. So you start with the experience of people who are using or receiving or trying to access services and you map their journey and their experience about what's working well, what's not working well, and you use that to improve it. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. And um, it's really important if you're trying to um, use, you know, bring a new technology to bear on an issue. And so that could be kind of retrofitting. The example that we um, use in the report is an example from Snook where they'd been trying to create a new technology for fishermen um, called safety net, which kind of um, doesn't allow in kind of the fish that you don't want. So it's good for conserving or, or sustaining fish. And so they designed this amazing technology and that's all brilliant, but no one was using it. And the reason no one was using it is because they hadn't understood the context in which it was used and they hadn't designed a service around it. So when you think about a service, you often go through five stages. So it's becoming aware, it's joining, it's then using a service, deepening the use of a service, and importantly, leaving a service. 
And quite often people jump to the kind of using, assuming people will even know about it in the first place. And I think that's been the issue with many government schemes. But on this kind of safety net technology, what they hadn't done is they hadn't spent any time in the fishing village with fishermen and women trying to understand, you know, well, where did they find out about new technologies? Well, it's from, it's down the pub. It's from each other. It's not from a website anywhere. Um, so they had to do all of that work to really understand why people would want to use it in the first place and to design it in a way that, you know, worked on a boat and you could get it from the, from the shop into the, into the boat and all the rest of it. Um, so one more point on that is um, quite often though service design is focused on one service. And actually with retrofit, there's probably quite a few services that people need to navigate and that makes it even more difficult. So in a way, good process um, service design at the moment is kind of shifting to ecosystem or eco-service design, which says actually you need to not only understand how people experience a kind of collection of services and make sure that's all feels smooth and connected, but also work with all the different organizations providing services to make connections and interdependencies between them so that they can see themselves as an ecosystem rather than these individual things that people might need to access. 